This is session 9 of the Foundations in Finance module and in this session I'd like to extend the discussion of valuation to contingent cash flows or options as they're more commonly called. So let's start off by looking at what makes an option an option. An option provides its holder with the right to buy or sell a specified, an asset, a specified asset called an underlying asset at a fixed price any time before the expiration of the option. So think of what goes in there. There is an underlying asset. Without it, an option cannot live. The price is fixed up front. That price is called the strike price. Here's what makes options interesting. It's a right, not an obligation. And the best way to see how options work is, what, with, uh, is with what's called a payoff diagram. So let's look at the payoff diagram for a call option. A call option gives you the right to buy an underlying asset at a fixed price. You can use that right or exercise that right any time through the life of the option, if you have an American option, or you can exercise it only at the expiration of the option, which is called a European option. Nothing to do with geography, just specifies when you can exercise. So the payoff diagram for a call option looks as follows. The strike price, the price at which you can buy, becomes the, the tipping point. If your actual stock price is greater than that strike price, you will exercise the option and make the difference. So for instance, if you get the right to buy at 50, you will exercise that right only if the stock is higher than 50. If the stock price drops below 50, you will not exercise. It's a right, not an obligation. So what you will lose is what you originally paid to get the option. Limited losses, potentially unlimited profits. You see what's different about a put option? A put option gives you the right to sell an asset at a fixed price any time before expiration. Obviously, you will exercise this right only if the stock price drops below the strike price and you will throw away the option and not exercise it if the stock price rises above. Again, let's think in terms of payoff diagrams. If the stock price is less than the strike price, you will exercise and make the difference. If the stock price is higher than the strike price, you will say, I'm sorry I bought that option and essentially write off whatever you originally paid. Here too, the loss is fixed and the profits, while not infinite because the price can't drop below zero, are potentially very large. As you look at these payoff diagrams, you should already start to see the variables that determine the value of an option. Three of those variables relate to the underlying asset. First, as the value of the underlying asset goes up and down, the value of all options, both calls and puts, will go up and down as well. And here's why. You get the right to buy at a fixed price. If the value of the underlying asset goes up, call options will get more valuable. Put options, since you get the right to sell at a fixed price, will get less valuable. So the first variable that drives the value of options is the value of the underlying asset. The second is the variance in that value. And here's where options are different from any other type of asset. Now with bonds and stocks, you notice that if I made the cash flows more risky, the value got lower. Risk was a bad thing. With options, as I increase the risk, the variance in value of the underlying asset, both calls and puts become more valuable. That sounds mysterious at front. You're saying, how come? Remember those payoff diagrams? You had limited losses and potentially unlimited profits at the call option, limited losses and very large profits with the put option. Variance is now your friend because you're protected on the downside. So the greater the variance in the value of the underlying asset, the more valuable options on that asset will become. The third is any dividends you receive on the underlying asset can affect the value of the options. When a stock pays a dividend, its stock price drops. So when the stock price drops, remember call options become less valuable, put options become more valuable. So if you expect dividends to be paid out on the underlying asset, reducing the price of the asset over the life of the option, you will reduce the value of call options and increase the value of put options. Value of the asset, variance in the value, expected dividends, all on the underlying asset. There are two variables relating to the options that can affect its value. The first is the strike price. With a call option, the right to buy at a fixed price will become more valuable the lower that price. So the lower the strike price of a call option, the more valuable a call option will become. The reverse is going to be true for a put option. The lower the strike price, the less valuable a put option will be. And the longer the life of an option, this is true for both calls and puts, the more valuable the option will be because you have more time to plan. The only macro variable that affects the value of options is the riskless rate. And here's why. 
with both call and put options, especially for European option, you will not exercise till the end of the option. So you don't have to pay that fixed price if you're if you have a call option until three months from now, six months from now. You think so what? The higher interest rates are, the lower the present value of what you committed to pay. So call options will become more valuable as interest rates go up and put options will become less valuable because whatever you collect six months from now is worth less now. Those are the six variables that drive the value of an option and here's where I'm going to introduce the basics of option pricing. Option pricing models can be incredibly complex and messy but here's what I want you to think about. All option pricing models are built on two building blocks. The first is the notion of a replicating portfolio. What does that mean? I can create something that looks just like the option in terms of cash flows by combining the underlying asset and either borrowing or lending. So the notion of a replicating portfolio is that you can create, using the underlying asset and a riskless asset, something that looks exactly like your option. To do this though, the underlying asset needs to be traded, the option needs to be traded, you need to be able to borrow and lend money at the risk-free rate. So if you can create a replicating portfolio, combination of the underlying asset and borrowing or lending that has the same cash flow as the option, the second leg of option pricing models kick in. It is that if these two assets have the same cash flows, the option and the replicating portfolio, they have to trade at the same price. Now the easiest way to think about this replicating portfolio is to, put, is to make it go from the abstract to reality. I can create something that looks like a call option by borrowing money and buying a certain number of shares of the underlying stock. I can create something that looks like a put by selling short a certain number of shares in the underlying stock and lending money. Now you're saying, well, a certain number of shares? How many shares? How much do I need to borrow or lend? That's effectively what every option pricing model is trying to do, is to come up with that replicating portfolio. The simplest way to see an option pricing model at play is with what's called a binomial option model. In a binomial option model, here's what, here's what you have. You have a stock that can move to one of two points at the next time period. So let's suppose you have a stock trading at 50. The next time period, the stock can either go to 70 or drop to 35. If it goes to 70, in the following time period, it can jump to 100 or drop to 50. If it goes to 35, it can jump back up to 50 or drop to 25. It's called binomial because in every leg, you can go to only one of two prices. Now, here's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to look at a call option with a strike price of 40 on this stock, which is going to expire at t equal to 2. The way you value options is you always start with the end known. When the option is exercised, you know what the cash flows are and you work backwards. So let's say you have a strike call with a strike price of 40. If the stock goes to 100, that call is going to give you $60 in cash flows, right? You'll buy at 40 and sell at 100. If the stock goes to 50, you'll get 10. And if the stock goes to 25, you will not exercise the option. Your gross cash flow will be zero. Here's what you're trying to do with the replicating portfolio. You're trying to create a combination of the stock and borrowing that will have exactly the same cash flows as the call. So let's move one leg back to where the stock is trading at 70. I'm trying to create a combination of stock and borrowing that will create exactly the same cash flows as the call. For purpose of abstraction, let's call the number of shares you buy D and the amount you borrow B. Hang in there for a moment, you'll see exactly what I'm trying to do. So you're going to go out and buy D shares of stock when the stock is 70 and borrow B dollars. Let's say the interest rate is 11%. A period thereafter, you've got to pay the borrowing back. That's a B times 1.11 is the borrowing payback. And if the stock goes to 100, the D shares of stock you what will be worth 100 times D. 100 times D minus the borrowing paid back with interest has to be equal to 60. If the stock goes to 50, 50 times D minus the borrowing paid back with interest has to be equal to 10. The replicating portfolio, same cash flows. Two equations, two unknowns. You solve for it. Here's what you get. D is equal to 1. B is 36.04. You see, what does it even mean? If you go out when the stock is 70 and you borrow $36.04 and buy one share of stock, you've created a replicating portfolio that is going to have exactly the same cash flows as a call with a strike price of 40. It's going to cost you $33.96 to create this replicating portfolio. Think of what? You go out and buy a share, it's going to cost you 70, but since you borrowed 36.04, it's a difference you got to come up with. That 33.96 has to be equal to, the, to what the call is trading for because that's the arbitrage principle kick in. I have a value for the call if the stock goes to 70. I repeat this process if the stock goes to 35. 
I set up DNB, I solve for DNB, and if the stock goes to 35, I need to buy 0.4 shares of stock and borrow $9.01 to replicate the option. That cost me $4.99 to create. That becomes the value of the call if the stock goes to 35. At the value of the call, 33.96, the stock goes to 70. The value of the call of $4.99 if it goes to 35, I can now go back to my initial node. Repeat the process. Go out and borrow D, borrow B. And in this case, I'm trying to make sure the values I get if the stock goes to 70 and the stock goes to 35 are 33.96 and 4.99. Now you can already see why you have to start at the end nodes and work backwards. And if I solve for D and B at, at the current time, I get D equal to 0.8278 and B equal to 21.67. If I go out and borrow $21.61 today and buy 0.8278 shares of stock, I've created not just a replicating portfolio, but it'll cover every one of my costs from this point on. That replicating position today, it's going to cost me $19.42. That becomes the value of the call today. Replication, arbitrage. You can already see that this can become a very tedious process. If I have a three-month option, I make time one minute. Think of how many, how many little legs there will be in my binomial tree. In fact, as T gets smaller, if I assume the price changes also get smaller, let's call it a continuous price distribution, this binomial distribution becomes the normal distribution and the, the option pricing model, the binomial option pricing model actually becomes the black, so, uh, black shorts. And I'll talk about this that in a moment. Is if time becomes smaller, price changes remain large, prices can still jump. Then the limiting distribution is going to be some kind of a jump process distribution and option pricing gets a lot messier. It's much easier working with a normal and a continuous distribution. And while it cuts some corners, makes some assumptions, that's part of the reason people continue to use the black shoals. It's a much more convenient model to use because it's much easier to work with than a binomial. You think, what's in the black shoals? The black shoals model actually predates the binomial. In the black shoals model, the value of a call option is a function of five variables. S, which is the value of the underlying asset, K, which is the strike price, T, which is the life of the option, R, which is the riskless rate, and sigma squared, which is the variance in the value of the underlying asset, five variables. But if you remember, there were six variables that I said affected the value of options. Notice the missing variable here. The missing variable here is, is, is dividends, right? The original Black-Scholes was designed to value dividend-protected options because mathematically it was easier to do. And in the original Black-Scholes, Here's what you have. The value of a call is S, which is the value of the underlying asset today, times N of D1. You see, what's N of D1? If I turn very quickly to the next page, N of D1 is an area under the normal distribution. And if you look at to the right, you actually see the, this is a cumulative normal distribution. Basically, it looks at the area. And that number is a number between minus 1 and plus 1. It's like a probability. That's what the N of D1 is. So S times N of D1 minus K minus RT. You're saying, what is that? If you remember when we talked about time value and continuous time, E minus RT is a present value factor. I'm taking the present value of the strike price because I don't have to pay the strike price till expiration. The original Black-Scholes was designed to value European options which can be exercised only at expiration. So I take the present value of the exercise price and I multiply by N of D2, another area under the distribution. So how do I know what that area is? You compute D1 and D2, and if you look at D1 and D2, mathematically they may seem messy, but look at the variables that go into them. S, K, all of the variables that drive the value of the option are in D1 and D2. So here's how you sequence it. You get S, K, R, T, and sigma. You plug them in and get D1 and D2. You go to the distribution. You convert the D1 and D2 into N of D1 and N of D2. Then you plug it in. you got a value for the call. I know there are legions of people who plug and chug with Black-Scholes models, but embedded in the Black-Scholes model is the replicating portfolio. You're saying, where? Remember the replicating portfolio, you borrow money and you buy a certain number of shares? In the Black-Scholes, here's how you read the Black-Scholes. KE minus RT times ND2 becomes what you borrow. N of D1 is the number of shares of the underlying asset that you buy. It's called the option delta. Almost everything you do in option pricing is built around the replicating portfolio, and you see that when you look at the equation. Now, of course, the original Black-Scholes did not adjust for dividends, and some of the options, in fact, many of the options you may be pricing might have a dividend in the underlying asset. 
There's a simple way to incorporate into option pricing if you're willing to make an assumption. If you're willing to assume that the dividend yield remains constant over the life of the option, here's what you can do. You can bring dividends into the process by first taking the current stock price and reducing it for the expected dividends over the life. Remember we said when dividends get paid out, the stock price gets reduced. SE minus y YT is just the stock price discounted for the, so it's the stock price adjusted for future dividend payments. And the other thing that happens is your carrying costs become smaller. And here's why. When you go out and borrow money now, you can now make some of the interest payments with the dividends you receive on the underlying stock. So the R minus Y. So in the D1 and D2, you now have a Y incorporated. If you make those changes, you have a very easy way of adjusting the black shoals for dividends. Incidentally, if you know the value of a call, getting to the value of a put is relatively simple because calls and puts are linked at the hip with what's called put call parity. And in fact, if you can value calls, you should always be able to derive the value of a put from the value of a call. So here's something to keep in mind. The Black-Scholes model was designed for a restrictive environment. Stocks that don't pay dividends and European options. That said, its simplicity is its biggest selling point. It has those five variables. You plug them in, you come up with the value for the Black-Scholes. A binomial model is a much more flexible model. It allows for early exercise, but it requires a lot more work to fill in the nodes. If you are willing to cut those corners, the Black-Scholes model will work reasonably well in terms of telling you what the value of an option is. In fact, it might give at least a floor on your option pricing value because most options are American options can be exercised early. So I know this was a speedy introduction to option pricing, but we can build on this as we go through this process, both in corporate finance and in valuation.